Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Jacob Restituto, and what you're about to hear is what I think a really, really phenomenal conversation between myself and JT Roach, where we talk all things songwriting, all things music industry, and how he placed his music and his song, essentially, with the very successful band, One Republic. Let's get into it. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Jacob Restituto, and I'm a musician from Northport, New York, and today we have the absolute pleasure of having JT Roach here on the channel, coming all the way from LA. JT, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the channel. Thanks for having me. I'm super stoked to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure, man. My pleasure. Looking forward to the conversation. So for people that aren't super familiar with who you and your story, uh, can you just kind of go right into and kind of just give a little bit of backstory on who you are and what you do in the industry? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, my name is JT Roach. I'm a singer, songwriter, music producer, artist. Um, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. I've been in Los Angeles for 10 years. Uh, come, it'll be 10 years next spring. And I'm signed with Prescription Songs for Publishing. And I'm currently working through a deal with Sony Orchard for distribution for my artist project. Um, but I write for both my project and for other artists and for film and TV. And basically just hustling out here in L.A., trying to make a living doing what I love, um, writing songs. And I'm making it work. So, yeah, how was that for No, that's phenomenal. That's really, it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's a really interesting industry, the songwriting industry. And I think it'd be really cool to expand on for people that aren't super familiar with the industry and how it works. And I think most people are surprised when you know, the Grammys were on, for example, and like Ed Sheeran wins a Grammy, but then seven people go up with the song and they're like, wait, I thought this was Ed Sheeran's song. Right. It's like, oh no, there's like seven people that wrote the song with him. But also just the idea of syncing music and music that goes into TV shows and movies. So for people that aren't super familiar, you know, there's a bunch of different types of writings. There's, you know, like the co-writing, there's, you know, ghost writing, there's sync writing. Can you ex explain from your experience what the difference between all of them are and like kind of just, just elaborate? Yeah, of course. So, um, you have your major pop stars in the music industry and everybody who's on top 40 radio. And behind the scenes, there's songwriters and producers writing and producing a lot of your favorite songs. And though they're not public facing um, artists, they're all artists themselves. And um, I'm part of that you know, community in Los Angeles. Largely it's Los Angeles and Nashville, but some New York, some all over the country. but definitely a concentration in Los Angeles. You know, a typical day for me is I go to a session and I am in a room writing with a couple other people, usually three to four people and it's songwriters and producers and we'll make a song and write it for either a major pop artist or we'll write it for a film and TV placement or we'll write it for one of the artists who's in the room. Um, you know, it just kind of depends on the day what you're writing for. Um, and sometimes you don't really know, sometimes the song takes its own trajectory and I always try to get out of the way what the song is trying to become when I'm in a room creating so um, it makes my job really exciting because you never know where the song is going to end up and you're really just kind of planting a creative seed um, and you never know if it's going to turn into a tree or if it's going to sit on a hard drive or if it could be the song that changes your life um, you know I've had songs stay on a hard drive for three to four years before anything happened to them and then they were life-changing songs for me so it's you know it, it kind of feels like gambling or like planting seeds. It's a, it's some of the work is on spec. Um, some of it's on, on a fees basis, but um, you know, it's never a dull moment in the music industry trying to make a living writing songs. Um, and I'm just really grateful. I've been able to do it. Yeah. It's phenomenal, man. Um, so many good talking points within even just your explanation of that. Uh, you did a really great job explaining that. And, I, and um, but it, it's really some really cool talking points, like I said. So just kind of just piggyback based on the first or the last thing you said, just, you know, the, the fees aspect. Um, I, um, as somebody that hasn't been in that in particular part of the industry, I've always been curious about how the, you, you mentioned things could be on spec or versus actually on a fees basis. How much of it is, is, is your time invested in writing and hoping something that happens with this versus actually like being paid up front or, um, and kind of piggyback on that question is how much of it are you intentionally writing right off the bat for something versus the hypothetical idea of, oh, this could be good for blank. Right. I, it, it truly is different every day. Um, and something my dad always says, he, he runs a business, a business out of Madison, Wisconsin, a video production company, and he's a writer himself. And something that he's taught me that I really feel like applies in my industry as well as any industry is just that business is relationships. So the more that I'm in this industry, the more I'm like, okay, we want to create something that finds a home. We want the song to come out, you know, because we don't want to just be making songs that are going to sit on a Dropbox account and never come out, you know, so... I'm always thinking about the angle of 
you know, when I walk into a room with other songwriters and producers, how can we get the best song with these people and how can we find the best home for the song to come out and for people to, people to enjoy the song. And that takes all sorts of different shapes. You know, um, today I'm writing with a really talented artist named Zohara, um, who I've written with before. And she has a massive electronic dance music song with a guy named Griffin, but she's also just an amazing songwriter for pitch records as well. So today we're writing pitch records for a specific K-pop artist that we're hoping to place a record with. Um, and we're just writing the beats that a friend of mine um, named Boz Billions, um, he sent me instrumentals for this K-pop artist. So we're going in just a one-on-one -on -one session to write beats for that artist. But we could easily, you know, she could walk into the room and say, you know what, I'd rather write something for me today or write something for electronic pitch. And those would all still make, those options would still make sense. And, you know, every day is flexible like that. You know, you try to get in the room and be open-minded about how to make the best use of everyone's time and, um, and headspace. So, um, you know, I always, I always think of the Bruce Lee quote, you know, you pour water into a glass, it becomes the glass. You pour water into a vase, it becomes the vase. Something to that extent where I think the lesson is basically um, fill the space that should be filled to get the best results. And I try to do that in sessions. Um, you know, some sessions I'll be in the session and I have my lyricist brain going or I'll have my melodic brain going or I'm, I'm producing and I'm playing guitar you know, whatever's needed in that room is the role that I try to step into. So it definitely keeps the job exciting, you know? That's for sure, man. Absolutely. Very, very interesting. Um, kind of piggybacking on one of the things you originally said as well is, um, you know, you're planting these, li like every song you write is, you know, gambling, but it's also like a little bit of a seed. And I um, just mm -hmm. wanted to piggyback off of a, a book that I've been reading. Have you read uh, Rick Rubin's book yet? The uh... I'm, I'm like maybe a third of the way through it. It's on my shelf right over there. Um, it's dense to me. It's the kind of thing where I'll read a few chapters and I'll need to like take some oh, time to like and ruminate over it because it's he's got so many great little anecdotes in there and so much good food for thought. Um, I'm really enjoying it so far. Yeah, absolutely. I'm about to, I'm like, same thing. It's, I'm like two thirds of the way in. It's like a 350 page book, I would say, right? Something like that. Um, yeah, like you can get through it. You can get through it. Oh yeah, for sure. sure. But like there, it's written yeah. in these like one and a half page little the anecdotes kind of thing um right. which kind of makes it easy to digest because you could read two of them and be like okay let me let me just sit on this but then it takes two months to read <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i've, I've had bar i took it out from the library actually and i was I've, I've been out of the library for like four months at this point <laughs> point being though is um it i it just it talks about that uh like pretty frequently throughout the uh the book that you essentially your, your job is just to plant the seed and, and and or essentially take this seed out of the packet the creative idea out of the packet and plant it and then whatever happens to the seed after the fact is kind of out of your control, whether it gets eaten by an ant underground or whether it turns into a huge sunflower, like it's like kind of out of your control after that point. And it's just an interesting concept. Yeah. I, the metaphor makes a lot of sense to me and it really is what my job feels like because there is a certain amount of luck involved in it and a lot of things have to go right for a really great release to go from start to finish and to release into becoming a big record um i think that there's things that you can do to improve your chance to be lucky um you know i think the longer that i'm in this industry I, you know i saw an, an interview with um my friend jq um he was talking about some amazing r&b records that he wrote um he wrote yeah for usher and wow. among a million other and his he said something that really resonated with me was just that you really have to will these things into existence not only on the creative side where you're in a room we're going to go we're going to walk into this room and four hours later we're leaving with an incredible record but even on the business side once you have that record i think having the ambition on the business side to say i'm going to will this into a release you know you're kind of a salesman after the after the salesman or saleswoman after you have your demo because then you have to pitch the record and sell the record to the artists the labels the managers the publishers and get everybody excited about it so that's like part of the business that i feel like i'm always trying to improve on and learn in because I, I love the creative side so much and i think my business brain on the on the music business side 
um, is always trying to catch up to how much passion I have for the creative side. I think that's not uncommon for people who do this. You know, we're, we're all here because we love music. Mm. Um, and I think learning the business side becomes a necessity for, for your life, you know? Sure. Absolutely. Otherwise you end up like Elvis and, you know, super rich, I'm super famous, but poor, you know, <laughs> it's a common story, you know, yeah, so it's a, unfortunately a common story. People sign, sign deals or just have teams that exploit them. Um, I'm super grateful that I've never been put in that situation and I've, I've got an amazing team, but um, it's something you got to watch out for for, for sure. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now you mentioned those seeds then flourishing into something, you know, big and, and, and essentially becoming a couple of life changing moments and our life changing songs uh, for a bit of context and just kind of to give people like inspiration as to like what's actually possible. Can you can you elaborate on that? Yeah, of course. Um, so I can use a couple examples just from my own life. Um, uh, if that helps illustrate. Yeah, the point. Great, absolutely. So I wrote a song with my friends, Andrew Wells, Jim Tay, and Kevin Fisher, who goes by Sweet Talker. And we wrote a song called Somebody to Love. And I always really liked the day one demo. We always got good feedback on it, but it was in my Dropbox folder for probably three to four years. And it just didn't stick. You know, we didn't find an artist for it. Um, for whatever reason, it, it, we didn't place it yet. But I, every time I listened to it, I always thought it was a special song. And about four years ago, I submitted it for a TV show called NBC Songland, which was kind of like The Voice or American Idol, but for songwriters where, you know, you submit songs and you try to place them with the major artists who are on the show. And every episode has an artist. And I submitted my song and I ended up um, winning the One Republic episode season finale of Songland. And I placed my placed that record, Somebody to Love with One Republic, who's like one of my all time favorite bands. Ryan Tedder, one of my one of my uh, biggest inspirations as somebody who's an incredible songwriter, sure. but who has his band and is an amazing singer. You know, he wrote Halo for Beyonce, um, one of the best pop songs ever. Apologize, one of the best pop songs ever. So, you know, that was a very surreal moment. Um, and it all came from a song that was sitting on, a, on my Dropbox account for four years that people had repeatedly told me, you know, meh. You know, you got that reaction just enough times, but, um, you know, I always say you're one song away from your life being completely changed and you may have written the song already. You know, if you're a songwriter, you just never know. And more recently, um, just for a second example, Please, yeah. just, just so I can hide myself up some more off of a release that I'm really pumped off recently. Um, I wrote a song in about half an hour to a beat for a K-pop pitch that um, with Boz Billions, John Fulford, and some other really talented songwriters and producers, um, we placed with NCT Dream, who's a huge K-pop boy band group. And the album did like 3.5 million in hard copy sales wow. the first week. Um, that was just a few weeks ago. And that was, you know, I wrote the chorus to it in half an hour. And six months later, it's probably the biggest song that I've ever placed. Um, so those stories do happen. But in people would see that and say oh you got really lucky but i'm writing you know one to two to three songs every single day and just hustling constantly so it's like did i get lucky or have i just been really busting my butt yeah there? you know there, there's the, the the saying that if you get up to bat enough uh you'll you're bound to hit a home run at some point um but most people don't yeah, exactly. don't get up to bat enough most people don't maybe right they, they strike out twice and they're like yeah i guess this isn't for me meanwhile like you said you probably write you know, if you're writing two songs a day, that's 600 songs a year or 700 songs a year. You know, I say there's the truth, which is that there's way more talented people than me out here. But I would argue that I'm amongst the people who are working the hardest out here and who love this the most. I really think I'm just as big of a fan of music as most people out here. So I think that that's what has given my career longevity is just I really genuinely love doing this. And I I never feel... I mean, it, it can be hard, but, you know, they say if you if you find a career that you love, you never work Absolutely. in your life. It's something like it, that. And it's you know? a genuinely true statement. There are, of course, are things inside that career that you're like, oh, I don't necessarily feel like doing this today. But not, it's it's that's the 1% compared to the, the 99% that you do love, as opposed to most people that have the 1% they actually do like about their job and the 99% that they hate. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, there's, there's, there's some stuff that, you know, 
do, oh man, I'm exhausted. Do I want to go cut those vocals? But yeah, exactly. you, know, I, you know, I remind myself like, you know, I would rather be doing this job than any other job in the world. And I'm so lucky to be able to do it. So yeah. As a musician myself, one one thing I've been quoting a lot lately is the fact that, uh, you know, for, is that you're one video away, you know, one video away from everything. Because, like, you know, now it's it's TikTok and YouTube and social media where it's like that one video can change. You put, put up a video of your song and changes everything, man. There have been so many countless artists that have, in the past couple of years, their lives have changed. And they're starting to become household names or, like, relatively popular names that they put up a video and boom everything changes. So the concept of you're one song away, you're one video away is uh, very dear to my heart. Every time I'm like posting, hitting the post, I'm like, this could be the one, baby. This could be the one. <laughs> it's real. It's so real. I, I, I see that all the time. Um, you know, I'm lucky my, my publisher, um, Prescription Songs, um, they're really great about putting me in with artists. And they put me in with this girl, Maddie Zom, um, a couple years ago. And I heard a couple of her demos and I was like, hmm, these demos are really, her voice is not only amazing, but she has a real lyrical voice. She has a story to tell. And one of her demos was a song called Fat Funny Friend. And I was like, man, this is a really powerful story. And sure enough, you know, I wrote uh, maybe a dozen songs with her and one of her songs just totally popped on TikTok. And it was that song, Fat Funny Friend. Um, and I wrote like a few other songs with her that are doing well around that. Um, but in a matter of six months, she went from not having a pub deal, putting out her own music. You know, she placed top 12 on American Idol and wasn't sure what she wanted to do. Wasn't sure if she wanted to go into music. So six months later, she signed to AWOL. You know, she's got, she's getting like hundreds of thousands of, you know, plays on any post that she does. And she's touring the world. You know, she just toured in Europe and people are hearing her amazing voice and hearing her amazing stories. And it's completely changed her life. So, yeah. And, and that's happening right now. Um, TikTok, particularly, and Instagram Reels, you know, you just never know when. Never it's gonna... know, man. It's so interesting. Oh. So interesting. Yeah. And like you said, though, you never know. You could have already written the song, too. Like sometimes, like you said, you, we hear these stories of people being like, oh, yeah, I wrote the song five years ago. I just happened to repost the video or post a new video of me singing that old song and or 10 years ago. And, everything it just had to be the right season it's just it's so interesting you know uh, kind of on, on that thread just uh, this was pretty encouraging for me to hear a friend of mine um or i would say an acquaintance like i i know her through the industry i've met her a couple times we're not like hanging out every friday night um <clears throat> but i saw on on social media recently that uh she she's a saxophone player and she just got the gig to do the world tour with the jonas brothers um and it was just interesting oh, yeah awesome. it was, it's crazy like like she she goes from playing in a wedding band uh, on the, in the local New York area, uh, you know, a decent, a very like really good uh, wedding band. Like they're one of the top ones, but still it's, it's a, it's a wedding band. Um, right. Playing th four, three, four times a week, you know, ridiculous hours, you know, until like two o'clock in the morning, all the time driving all over the tri-state area. Two months later, uh, playing in the front of the stage by herself with Nick Jonas on the piano at Yankee stadium is where the, the opening night. Of, I'm like, it's just insane. It's insane. And that, here she is. That's so incredible. You know, but like all, you know, and I was speaking with her and I was like, you know, like that's like, congratulations. It's sick. Like, how did it happen? She's like, well, um, the, the, the trumpet player uh, knew the musical director and threw my name in the hat and I was the first call. And it's like, it's like you said earlier, it's all about relationships, but like she's been doing this. She's, I don't know, like probably been doing this 15 years. You know, she's, she's younger, right. probably in her thirties, but like probably starting her twenties and like, and all of a sudden, now you're playing Yankee Stadium for the Jonas Brothers, you know? Totally. <laughs> it's insane. And you could you could say, oh, man, she got lucky. She had a big moment. But she put in all the work to be good enough so that when she got to that, not only so that yeah. she got to be a part of that moment, but also that she could be the artist that she needed to be in that moment to perform the way she needed to perform. So, you know, it's just, a, you know, you can't help but root for people when – they have a win like that because they put clearly put in the work to make it happen and show that you know, it, I, you know show that it's possible like be inspired rather than like mm -hmm. you know like hey why not me well like hey well how about the fact that if it was them that you could have it all happen to you as well um but like totally. like uh it, i don't know if this is a phrase or not but essentially the, the, the fact that like it takes a lot of work to get lucky exactly yep exactly i would love to ch chat about placement just in general like whether it be placing um, with artists or placing with sync, 
Um, can you just share your experiences on that and like how it typically works for you? Or if it's different for other artists, just what, how that, in, cause I'm not familiar generally yet with that artist, uh, with that side of the industry at all. So I'm, I'm super curious just for myself. Well, getting placements, you know, like I said, businesses, relationships and getting placements when you first get to LA or Nashville, or if you're trying to place records from wherever else you are, it's tough. You know, um, I've been out here 10 years and I feel like I'm just establishing those relationships still. And, um, you know, very often it, it feels like, okay, I wrote this song. I want to just hand it straight to Justin Bieber or hand it straight to the biggest artists in the world, like Beyonce or whoever. But very often who you need to look to is the artist to your left and your right. Who are you in the room with and the people who you're on the come up with, you know? Yeah. So that was, that was something that I learned early on was like, okay, look at these amazing artists who I'm on the come up with. How do I stay involved with them? How do I keep working with them? Because there's so much potential. And sure enough, so many of those people are big artists now and are successful singer songwriters, producers, you know, label execs, publishers, managers so i think it takes time um but yeah businesses relationships and over time you build your relationships and your contacts and following up with them and connecting dots that make sense you know that's something that i pride myself on is if something really makes sense you know even if it's a record that one of my friends wrote and they wrote a record that's perfect for an artist that i know personally i'll text them the song and just say hey my friend that wrote this song it's a no-brainer you know you should at least give this a listen um and doing those kinds of gestures for people, they would hopefully do the same for me. And you can connect more dots and make more make more plays. I, lo I love the phrase, um, let's make a play on this. Or like, I think that that's something that people say a lot is like, how do we make a play with this song that we all love? You know, um, so the, the more I'm in the industry, the more, you know, not just a singer, songwriter, music producer, the more I'm putting on the A&R hat and going, how, how can I place this record myself with the relationships that I already have? Um, because, you know, I think a lot of people want their management or their publisher or their label to make, to move mountains for them or to make opportunities happen. But something that I've learned is that I'm the one in the room with the artists more often than not. And it's just, you know, my team is placing me in the room with these people and they're doing an amazing job of that. So mm. I think any door that your team can open for you, you need to be able to walk through that door and open 10 to 100 more doors um so i i take that very seriously anytime i'm in a in a studio or i get to go meet a new artist or team I, I shake everybody's hands i look i look them in the eye i follow up i get cell phone numbers i get emails i check in with them um i think those all those networking techniques and i, I don't think you have to do it in like a, a cheesy or a, a lame way you can just be genuine with people and just you know, show interest in what they're working on and, you know, share what you're working on and connect dots that make sense. No, it's phenomenal. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, man. It's, it's so interesting how much it's all about relationships in the sense of like, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people essentially about the idea of um, also not only just being the most talented person in the room, but like also just having the most emotional intelligence in the room, you know, cause like, while it is all about relationships and like, you want to be the best musician or writer or whatever that case is like you for as good as you can be, if you're a jerk, nobody's going to refer you to anybody else. That's so real. That's so real. I do. I do feel like a lot of my favorite writers, producers, artists um, have very high social IQs, emotional IQs, and also just social IQs. I think it's the same reason why I can be really exhausted on a weekend after being in rooms with people the whole week is because mm. I would argue I'm very attuned to everyone I'm in a session with. I want everyone to be comfortable. I want everyone to be able to be vulnerable because I think you need to be able to be vulnerable to be honest with someone. And it's, it's hard to do with people you just met. You have to walk into a room and go, you know, sometimes it's like you're going to write a song that is going to change your life. But to do that, you have to really dig into your emotions sometimes. So it's a very vulnerable experience. Yeah. Not to mention recording vocals with, you know, in a tiny room with people who you just met is a very vulnerable experience too. You know, even the best, even the best singers, even people who've been doing it for 10 years, you walk in a room with people you just met and you have to sing a difficult vocal and you're not going to do it perfect on the first attempt um, for most people. And that's a really vulnerable experience. So, any way you can make people feel comfortable um, helps that. But, um, you know, I find 
a lot of people who have been doing this for a long time are just very in tune to everyone who's in the room. Um, when I did NBC Songland, I was really impressed with Shane McAnally. I think he was, you know, a real star on that show. And being in the room with him, he's, he's one of the top Nashville country writers. He's got so many number ones and Grammys and all that. He's a very well established country writer. Um, and he, not to mention just like a super sweet person and easy person to be around. But I remember being in the session with him, writing with him. And I was like, he, he is reading this whole room. He knows what page everyone is on. And he is good at wrangling everybody to get a great song. And that's an art form in itself, you know, um, handling a room socially, emotionally, handling the egos in the room and, and leaving the room with a great idea. You know, um, that's an art form in itself. No, it's so true, man. It's, 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 Again, I, I think it's more important than uh, than typical talent. These the emotional challenges, but uh, yeah, it's it's so cool, man. I want to talk. You touched briefly on it, but I would love to hear a little bit more about your day to day. In the sense of like, are you what, what does a typical day look like? In the sense of like, are you working? Like, is it an eight hour? Because you mentioned the weekends, so I was curious. Like, do you typically work like nine to five, um, and then you know like live live a normal life out of it? Is it you know a couple hours a day? Is it more than that? Um, and then to piggyback on that. You mentioned also writing, you write two or three songs a day. So what does that look like to you? Is that, is that a three minute song, three songs of those, or is it, you know, a 30 second idea or, you know, like we're just kind of just elaborating kind of just to open up the, the industry a little bit more. Right. Yeah, of course. Um, so I try to make as many of the healthy habits that I have routines that I don't even need to think about. You know, I wake up, make coffee have a protein shake, do my daily vitamins, maybe do some yoga stretching, um, take my dog for a walk, go straight to the gym, weights, incline treadmill, sauna, you know, those, those things really help my anxiety to get a really great, great workout. Dude, in the I couldn't relate more. It's, it sounds just like my so schedule. Real. It's so, it makes such a difference. People don't realize. It makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference to get your exercise in first thing in the morning. Um, giant jug of water with electrolytes you know, healthy, bre healthy brunch, breakfast afterwards, a lot of eggs. Um, you know, once I've had my workout in, do emails, do business calls, you know, maybe do some meal prep, um, do my research on the artists that I'm working with that day, listen critically to, you know, like, like today I'm, I'm writing songs for a K-pop artist. I spent the morning listening to their catalog to try to put my, myself in the headspace of what would make sense for those artists so that when we go into write, I, I have an idea of what will work and what won't and what story they're trying to tell. Yeah, I think as many of the, uh, oh yeah, and then on, on my way back from the gym, I have a CD in my car and I do vocal warmups on the way back from the gym. That's another one of my favorite hacks is just finding ways to utilize your time. And that's one of my favorite hacks is just, you know, I just got out of the gym, my body's warmed up. I just did the sauna, I've been hydrating, do my vocal warmups in the car as I'm driving on the way. Well, everything else is warm. Place. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. Because if you if you try to do vocal warmups right when you wake up, it's like, ah. but um, after the gym, I find I'm, I'm loose and my body's feeling good. So that's a great time to do vocal warmups. Um, but that's the thing. Like now, I just don't even think about it. I just hit replay on the CD that's in my car. Yes, it's on a CD. Um, <laughs> in 2023. You know what? Though that makes it convenient because then you don't have to go find it on your phone, and that you, yeah, you, like you get distracted because you get a text message and you just never yeah, and you're halfway home and forgot to start it. Totally. And I've and I've had the CD for like eight years, which is why it's on a CD. Is like I've been using the same Jan's vocal lessons. It's called. Um, she is a vocal coach for a lot of you know has been a vocal coach for a lot of big artists. Just Google Jan's vocal lessons and get the warm ups thing. It's amazing. I do it you know, probably like three or four times a week. That's in the car. Now for the songwriting, like uh, when you write these songs, like, like I mentioned earlier, are they mm -hmm. typically like, do you finish the songs every day or is it like more like the concept of ideas of songs or how does, what does that look like? I would say typically the day one demo is like 80% to 90% of the way there. I think it depends on the song though. You know, if it's a singer songwriter vibe or if we're writing on acoustic, guitar or piano i think it's perfectly fine for it to be just the guitar or piano and one lead vocal day one because you want to make sure that the the main melody and the lyric is the best that it can be particularly for pop music which i write a lot of pop music um 
but it depends because if you're in with an artist and their vibe is a rock album maybe you're messing around with guitars the whole day and the lyrics are the very last thing you think of because there's so much vibe there already and maybe the chorus lyric is super simple you know it it really is different every single day but I'm very guitar vocal focused. I think that those are my strengths. So whenever I have people come through my home studio, we're either writing to instrumentals that are prepped or I like to write on piano and and guitar and really focus on a great lead vocal for day one. And then, you know, if we are killing it and we got the song in a few hours, maybe we'll go in and cut all the background vocals. Maybe we'll start putting in drums and bass and keys and synths um you know get weird with some samples um you know i love to in the first 24 hours actualize as much of the idea as possible but everything to me is second to the story the the main melody the lyric the vocal and just left to right the bones because you can always come back and adjust production but like that first 24 hour window getting the song 80 to 90 percent of the way there is my goal yeah. um and i think that, that takes precedent over everything else in my mind yeah yeah absolutely it's, it's i was just reading something or speaking to somebody about essentially the concept of um our brain getting distracted like to do things in passes so for example do the first pass of vocal takes rather than doing it in, in um you know whatever like uh oh let me just today do just the, the first verse and i'll do the whole thing and then tomorrow I'll come back and like then you edit tomorrow or, like as opposed to like doing little yep. things and and, and pieces um because every apparently it, it takes more work for your brain to re-engage into something if you disengage from it than it does for you to just stay engaged for an hour or something like that so it's, it is interesting though like to, to kind of on the same same concept is like in the first 24 hours it's still all fresh in your brain as opposed to like three days later trying to re-engage into the feeling you were feeling is it, very interesting um you told you said you made a comment that i think i want to piggyback on you, you said that all of this though is second to the great melody and great story um and i kind of just want to, to to quote the uh the great ryan tedder when he was talking about your song in songland um essentially writing the uh the um how did he phrase it essentially the the everlasting melody where it's like it's it's a Oh shoot! What was the word? I should have wrote it down. But essentially, talking about the melody. That- like people say evergreen. I don't know if he said evergreen, but I feel like he, yeah, you know, timeless. Timeless is more of what I was looking. At. Yeah, yeah, a timeless melody, yeah. and um, it is interesting because I was just talking. <laughs> speaking of the Jonas Brothers again, my wife is a huge fan of them, um, and she put on their record because we didn't go to the concert in New York, so we she put on the record when we were driving to a party or whatever, and she's we will the the record's like 17 years old or something like that and it still sounds like it could have been written yesterday and i'm like i turned her i'm like this song right here it, it's timeless it's like it was written 15 years ago whatever it was but it could have it sounds like it could have been written 50 years ago by Mar- marvin gay by, by marvin gay or today like it's just the melody is so good and it hasn't aged and it's just it's really interesting so you're right the production fades but like the melody doesn't matter yeah i think a really really great song you write like a really special song it can translate in so many ways um and it can translate with somebody else singing it in a whole different production you know look at um i will always love you you know you hear whitney houston sing that song you're like oh that's her song but you know dolly parton wrote it i think i remember reading too don't quote me on this but i think it was i will always love you and jolene she wrote in the same day wow it was like two of dolly parton's like biggest craziest songs she wrote in the same day that should say something about dolly Parton. i think she's one of the go for sure of course absolutely. Um, that's why i love writing stripped too because you also never know where the home for the song is going to be so like let's say we're writing on guitar really get a great vocal on guitar get the best possible song you can have you can pitch that record and people can hear edm production around it or they can hear like big huge sync drums you know a good a r or a good music producer writer can hear a stripped demo and hear the potential of where it could go and what the final product could be like. Um, it's hard to do that. Yeah. And we're not always right about that. But I think that's a benefit to day one, keeping the production as minimal as possible as you can, you know, take some time to listen to it and go, OK, what's the best home for this record? What does this sound like fully actualized? And, you know, being able to send it to your team and have everybody brainstorm together once you have the best version of the stripped song that you have um, can be really helpful. It's also really interesting to piggyback on how, how then sometimes, like you said, like finding the right genre for the perfect, that perfect melody is really uh, interesting as well. Like just as an example, like 
Mike Posner song, I Took a Pill in Ibiza. Like, mm-hmm. you know, the original song is an acoustic folk song. And then, yeah. and it's, it's okay. But then you, the, you know, the C version, the remix that everybody knows is it slaps. Like, you know, so it's just interesting. Mm-hmm. Like you said, the producer hearing that strip, like, like, you know, the demo and be like, okay, where should we go with this makes a big difference. You know what I mean? As opposed to kind of like forcing it into a hole already and saying here, this is where it's going to be. And then, then it's harder to kind of hear alternative ideas. A hundred percent. And, and it can go the other way too. You know, um, I remember I think it was William Fitzsimmons or somebody, somebody like that who does really great acoustic covers. You know, you'll hear an acoustic version of a song like Hey Ya by Outkast. And when you hear it stripped, you're like, oh, this is actually a dark lyric. This is a very yeah. good vibe. And, you know, even just doing a stripped acoustic cover can change a singer songwriter's life too, you know? Um, so it goes the opposite way. It doesn't always mean the song's got to get bigger. Sometimes this presenting the song in a smaller, more intimate way can be more powerful. But what it says to me is that the original song is a great song, you know? It also goes like it's a piggyback. It kind of piggybacks on the idea of the, um, I don't know if you've ever seen on YouTube, the whole concept of, you know, pop goes punk or punk goes acoustic, a country or, you know, mm-hmm. hip hop goes acoustic. And it's like when like these cover artists will take these popular songs and turn them into a completely different genre. And the reason they work is, yeah, the artist is talented and like, you know, it's now turned into your favorite genre. But I'd say it's even more so the fact that it's a good song, period. So you could have played, mm-hmm. you could play Mr. Brightside as a country song, as a folk song, as an acoustic song, as a EDM song, or as the original rock song. And it'd work anywhere because it's a good song. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. Like when you can hear it presented every way that you present it, people go, this is a great song. You know that they were doing their job day one in the room. Exactly. So, yep. you know, I want to be respectful of your time. So I just want to ask, you know, one or two more questions, but I'm, I'm curious. On, yeah, of course. As a songwriter, this is now not just unique to each individual songwriter, but are there particular topics that you particularly enjoy writing about and some that you're like, oh, I, I have a harder time writing about? Um, I feel like the default is often love songs for me. Just As easy I don't know. or hard? I think that's easy. You know, I've, I've always loved, I still love it though, you know, just because it's easy, you know, you can kind of raise the bar for how good it is, even if it's something that's a default for you. So I still love writing love songs, but I'm, I've been the last couple of years really trying to push myself to write darker stuff. And, um, I get really excited when I work with somebody who's like Maddie Zom, where they have not only an incredible singing voice, but they have a real voice and a real story to tell that's powerful. And a lot of people needed to hear those stories. And I felt that, you know, when I was writing with her, I was like, these stories are going to change people's lives because she is writing lyrics that really speak to people, you know, and you go to her concerts and you hear, you know, a lot of young people singing the lyrics back to her. Um, it's really, really powerful, you know? And then as a songwriter yourself, like as an artist yourself, let me rephrase as an artist musician yourself, how do you find the balance of writing for yourself versus pitching the song and be like, oh, this is a great song. Do I keep it for myself versus do I pitch it to NCT Dream? Totally. Yeah, that once in a while it is, it comes down to, oh, I really want this one for myself or, ah, you know, it's, it's probably a better play for my career as a whole if I, you know, pitch this record to a bigger artist, you know, you got to have some humility and just go, eh, it's probably a better play on the business side to, to give this one away. And there's all sorts of crazy singer songwriter stories. You know, one of my favorites is Ed Sheeran going to labels and playing love yourself for the labels. And they're all kind of like, ah, I don't really get it. And then he placed it with Bieber and they're like, Oh, why didn't you put that one out yourself? And he's like, I came and played it for you, <laughs> you know? And I, you know, I had, I've, I've had similar stories, but um, my artist project, the longer I've done it, the more I understand what the sound is. And I really try to explore where I feel like I do things differently. You know, I think my artist sound is, you know, I'm hoping to make music that sounds very much like me and not like anybody else. That's always the goal. And I feel like I'm understanding the more that I do it, how to do that. But as soon as you feel like you have something figured out, you got to get outside your comfort zone. and try yeah, something. So, sure. you know, um, but I did just finish an album um it's coming out this fall oh sick i'm really really excited to start rolling that out um should be coming out uh september october kind of window very cool it's soon man it's exciting yeah i'm really pumped. any singles ready yet or soon uh the first song is called dissolve um we don't have a release date for it yet uh, actually just this week we're wrapping a distribution deal with sony orchard um i'm really excited to be working with them it's, it's not a full-on label deal it's like a kind of admin type distribution deal um 
So if that works out, we'll roll with them and we should have release dates for September and October. So what does that look yeah, like first, though? Like what's the distribution look, deal look like typically? They take a percentage of, you know, what you make from the song to help you promote it to playlisting. And sometimes they offer you in advance. Um, you know, they kind of craft deals to what's appropriate for the artist. You know, they look at what kind of income you already have coming from your music and take that all into account. But ultimately they just listen to my album that I have coming out and they liked it and they want to help promote it. And That's so cool. we're, you know, we just include them on the team to, to promote yeah. it and make the business side make sense, which it takes some time, but um, I'm really excited about that. And it's, it's exciting to have some fresh blood to help promote the music. Um, so I'm looking forward to working with them and, um, I'm really excited about the album. I'm really proud of where it's at. So yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Yeah, man, absolutely. We might have to do a follow-up interview in two months and talk about the album. I'm super down. Absolutely. Super we'll down. set that up. Absolutely. Well, being respectful of your time, the way that I love to wrap up every interview is essentially asking the same question. And that question is, uh, now that you are where you are now in your career, where would you, uh, what advice would you give yourself when you were first starting off? I would say specifically for, for writer songwriters, I would say, allow yourself to write some bad songs, you know, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Just sit down and try every day and think about volume early on and try to have as much fun and get into the process as you can, because it never ends. You know, the, you know, they say what you have to do to get to a certain point in your career is what you're going to have to do to stay there. So like, if you have success, you're going to have to keep doing what you did to get there. So um, really falling in love with the process and don't be afraid to make mistakes and try to figure out what you do differently and w what's unique about your perspective and about your work and try to find your voice. And I say that in a general sense of just what your art sounds like compared to other people. What do you do differently? And if you can really discover how to do you and in a way that nobody else can do it, then you really have created value for yourself and that can really change your life. Absolutely, man. I, I was thinking about that kind of when you were talking about it slightly earlier. It's like, you look at anybody that's, we'll just use the radio in this next example, um, that's on the radio, like there aren't two artists that sound the same. They all sound unique to themselves. And like, it's interesting, right. very often so many artists will like try to emulate, be like, oh, I want to sound like Katy Perry. I want to sound like Ed Sheeran. Yep. And then when they make music that sounds like them, it doesn't really go anywhere. I mean, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a cap, I guess you could say, because people be like, oh, this is this sounds like Ed Sheeran, and I love Ed Sheeran, so I'm going to like this. Mm -hmm. But it's also, it's not Ed Sheeran. So, you know, but when the people mm -hmm. that find their own avenues are the people that stand out. And it's, it's a very interesting concept. For sure. I, I always think of that scene in the movie Ray with Jamie Foxx playing Ray Charles, where he's playing his songs for some music execs or whatever the scene is, and he's doing Nat King Cole and then he's doing another famous singer songwriter from the time and somebody comes up to him and says you know you can sound like anybody you want to that's how talented you are but you need to figure out how to sound like Ray you need to figure out how to sound like yourself um or you know you're capable of sounding like yourself and that was such a powerful scene to me and yeah I think of a lot of my favorite artists and you really know that it's their song in the first oh, 15 absolutely. seconds you know, you put on a Drake song and you hear Drake go, yeah, you're like, okay, let's go. It's a Drake song. You know, it's like you immediately know because they have, they have such a unique style and vibe um, that nobody else can do it. That's so true. It, that also being said, like the writing style, so many artists, you can hear, you can hear a song and be like, oh, that's a whatever country artist, but it was written by Taylor Swift. Oh, that's whatever pop artist, but that song was written by, you can just hear it. They have their own style. Totally. Their signature you know, they just have their style hundred percent, you know? Well, man, I really appreciate you taking the time. So, uh, um, if you can hang out for 30 more seconds, I just want to say a big thank you to first of all, you for taking the time, but also every single person that watched the full video or our uh, audio, wherever you listen to the, the or watch these, uh, I really appreciate you. Best way to support the channel is by checking out my own original music and then definitely go check out JT Broach's music available everywhere. All his links will be in the description of whatever platform you're listening to this on. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you again, JT, for being a part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you everybody for watching. We'll talk to you guys later. Peace out.